Now for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. These two are under the big umbrella of IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. Not to be confused with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, is characterized by chronic inflammation of the GI tract. Now both UC, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease are autoimmune diseases where the body attacks itself. So naturally it comes with flare-ups or exacerbation of symptoms followed by remission with no signs and symptoms. So it basically comes and goes. Now the causes for flare-ups are the triple S's. S for stress, S for smoking, and S for sepsis or infection. Now stress is the biggest NCLEX tip here. So just think, anything that can irritate the body can trigger an immune response, causing the body's own immune system to attack itself. So let's cover in detail ulcerative colitis first. So let the name help you. Itis means inflammation, col means colon, so put it together, inflammation of the colon and rectum. And ulcers in ulcerative colitis means that we have open sores that can bleed. So ulcerative colitis, we have a bleeding colon that is inflamed. So always let the name help you here and the patho becomes very simple. So the pathophysiology, we have inflammation of the colon or large intestine and ulcers inside the colon, like big long open sores that bleed, affecting the superficial outer layer of the GI tract. So signs and symptoms here. The big key one is 15 to 20 bloody liquid stools per day. Now all this blood leaving the body can cause anemia with decreased H and H, hemoglobin and hematocrit, as well as rebound tenderness. We must report that to the HCP, as well as abdominal pain. So Saunders mentions, the nurse is caring for a client with ulcerative colitis. Which finding does the nurse determine is consistent with this diagnosis? Decreased hemoglobin. Yes, from that bleeding. And a second question. The nurse is caring for a hospitalized client with a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. Which finding, if noted on an assessment of the client, should the nurse report to the primary health care provider, the PHCP? Rebound tenderness. Yes, write that down. We must report rebound tenderness. Now, in terms of Crohn's disease, the pathophysiology is very simple. We have inflammation of the entire GI tract here, mouth to anus, but mainly the small intestines are affected here. We see sporadic skip lesions that do not bleed. That's really key. Basically, healthy GI tissues among disease tissues, kind of like a mix and match. Now, where there are disease tissues, we see deep inflammation that can lead to fistulas, which are just open tunneling of the GI tract that can contaminate the body. Lastly, a classic sign of Crohn's disease is granulomas, bumps and lumps all over the small intestine, sort of looking like a cobblestone road in the bowel wall, typically around 30 to 40% of the time. So the memory trick, think Crohn's disease as Crohn's disease. The granulomas, or basically the bumps and lumps, are like little jewels of a crown that clog up the intestine. Now the key sign and symptom is five loose stools per day with mucus and pus, typically non-bloody, so that's how you know it's not ulcerative colitis, as well as staturia, that fatty stool, meaning that fat is not getting digested. Now in terms of management of care, both UC and Crohn's disease share similar interventions here. This includes fluid and electrolyte replacement. So strict INO monitoring, two liters of water daily, and even more when diarrhea is present, as well as hypokalemia, that low potassium, 3.5 or less, and daily multivitamins containing calcium. Now for diet, we include a high protein and calories to avoid losing weight, as well as Key term here, low fiber, to avoid stressing out that GI tract. And a big one here is keeping a food journal to know what was consumed and what causes symptoms. So write that down. A lot of students miss this. And lastly, small frequent meals to de-stress and ease the amount of workload on the GI tract. So Saunders mentions, 
The nurse is providing discharge teaching for a client with newly diagnosed Crohn's disease about dietary measures to implement during exacerbation episodes. Which statement made by the client indicates a need for further instruction? I should increase the fiber in my diet. No, with Crohn's disease, we think Crohn's disease. We decrease with low fiber in the diet. Never increase. Now, as far as other interventions here, for the pain, we administer analgesics. We avoid alcohol. We reduce caffeine, including coffee and tea. And for psychosocial, we include stress reduction, as well as encouraging the client to discuss their feelings. So go ahead and pause the screen and write these down. So next is the top missed NCLEX question for ulcerative colitis. So a client with ulcerative colitis, what are correct interventions? Select all that apply here. So option number one, discuss plans to decrease the client's stress. Yes, stress is a trigger. The triple S's, the number one tested is stress. Number two, give analgesics as prescribed. Yes, for pain management. Option three, limit fluids to 500 mLs per day. No, not for ulcerative colitis and definitely not for Crohn's disease. Guys, we're talking about massive diarrhea. These clients are at risk for dehydration from that diarrhea. So the client needs at least two liters or more. If the patient is having diarrhea, obviously it's more. Now, option four and five are correct. Increase protein foods with meals. Yes, we want to have high protein and high calories, as well as low fiber in both conditions. And option number five, monitor input and output closely. Yes, we want to monitor that fluid balance, keeping that fluid intake high. And option six, this one is incorrect. Recommend high fiber and low calorie diet. No. We want a low fiber and high calorie diet in both conditions. I know this question is talking about ulcerative colitis, but also with Crohn's disease. Now, in terms of complications, a bowel rupture from a toxic megacolon is a huge risk. This happens when the colon becomes too large or basically mega and ruptures, or even from a fistula or tunneling of the bowel. Either way, we have a spill of feces and GI content into the abdominal cavity. Kind of like having a broken sewer line that spills that nasty content all over the place. This can cause severe infection, causing rapid death from peritonitis, that infection inside the peritoneal cavity. So write this down, huge NCLEX tip. Peritonitis is priority. We want to report this to the HCP. So a fever over 100.3, rebound tenderness, as well as a rigid or board-like abdomen. This can be from inflammation like peritonitis or even internal bleeding, as well as increased pain and tenderness, restlessness, and a fast heart rate and respiratory rate, that tachycardia and tachypnea. So remember the ones that are bolded and highlighted here. Huge NCLEX tips. I would pause the screen and write this down for peritonitis. Now in terms of surgery, we can always cut out the bell that's causing the problem. And most clients get a colostomy or ileostomy that empties the bells into a bag, which we cover in a separate video. Now specifically for pharmacology, similar in both conditions. Just think of the patho here. The body's attacking itself in both conditions causing inflammation and loose, watery, or bloody stools. So to help the body stop attacking itself, we give sulfasalazine, just think of the S in sulfa, to stop the body from attacking itself. And for the inflammation, we give steroids to soothe the swelling. These end in zone, like prednisone. And for antidiarrheal, we give low paramide. So just think low bowel movements, to stop the loose stool. And we also give dicyclamine, like a dry cycle, you know what I mean? <laughs> to help dry up the watery stool. So let's play the top two most tested drugs from our pharmacology course. Now our second antidiarrheal is dicyclamine, given to patients with irritable bowel syndrome, that IBS, who can have up to 20 loose stools per day. So think dicyclamine 
helps to get the bells on a regular cycle. Now I mean, now guys, be cautious with the sound of like drug doxycycline or tetracycline, which is an antibiotic for acne. But guys, this ends in cycling like cycling a bike and not dicyclomene. So just be careful. Now the mechanism of action is quite simple here. It's antispasmodic and anticholinergic. It basically relaxes and dries the bell. So big side effect is constipation, dry mouth, and urinary retention. So for dicyclamine, just think a dry cycle on me bowels. You can't see, you can't spit, and you can't sh poop. Now guys, it dries everything up, so diarrhea is not a common side effect. Remember, dicyclamine dries. Guys, it's prescribed to stop the diarrhea. So a big distractor on subquiz banks was that diarrhea as a side effect. So just know it's treating diarrhea. Now, a big key point here is for patient safety. Basically, which patients to avoid. So it's not for paralytic ileus or a bowel obstruction. Guys, this is the most stressed contraindication on most quiz banks. So we always question the prescription or doctor's order for dicyclamine and paralytic ileus. And it's not for narrowed angle glaucoma, but cataracts are okay. And not for a full bladder, basically anything over 400 mLs, known as urinary retention. That's always a tricky test question. So once again, dicyclamine, think dry cycle. Can't see, can't pee, can't spit, and can't shh. So guys, no peeing, so not on a full bladder. No seeing, so not for a glycoma, but again, cataracts are okay. And no spit and shh poop. So watch for those stopped bells. Keywords, bowel obstruction and paralytic ileus. So the bowel can die if you give dicyclamine. Now, sulfacelazine is a sulfa drug, guys, given for inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, including both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, those autoimmune diseases where the body is attacking itself. So this med decreases colon inflammation by inhibiting prostaglandins, which I call our party poppers of inflammation, usually from an immune response. So it's considered an immunosuppressive med that weakens the body immune system to help the body stop attacking itself. Now, common side effects, guys, these are normal. So we have yellow-orange discoloration of the skin and urine. No need to follow up and no need to stop taking the med. Now, major adverse effects for patient safety. And again, NCLEX always concerns itself with patient safety. Key points here are SULF, S for sun-dried, Sunblock and a dry body, guys. So for sun, key term is photosensitivity. Teach patients to wear sunblock and avoid direct sun exposure. And since sulfas really dry out the body, they create U, urine crystals, or basically kidney stones, and L, low urine output with high specific gravity, over 1.030. That was a huge NCLEX tip, guys. Write that down elevated urine specific gravity so remember if urine gravity is high then the body is dry so remember f for fluid and folic acid we drink eight glasses of water per day and you take a folic acid supplement one milligram per day now don't let the nclex trick you some expected findings with ulcerative colitis we get bloody diarrhea and inflammatory markers will be elevated. So guys, don't stop the med. The med will actually help with this. Now, according to Kaplan, this medication, we continue even after symptoms subside. And on the HESI, it was contraindicated in patients with a sulfa allergy. Guys, write that down. This is a sulfa drug. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take your quiz and download the study guides.